I am Karen Hendrickson, the Molly Director. Uh, I want to start off by acknowledging uh, the Missoula Community Access Television for recording this event. We really appreciate having a record of this, and it will be in the archives as per Paul's instructions. Um, just to give you a little background, if you don't know what Molly is, it's the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, and we're one of 125 in the United States. Even though the curriculum is designed for people 50 and older, adults of any age can participate. And we offer offerings um, remote, in-person. And so if you live in Missoula, you live anywhere else in Montana or across the country, uh, you can participate in Molly. Uh, so uh, this event is what Molly hopes to be the first in a Regents Professor series. So stay tuned on that, Missoula, the University of Montana has, what, 11 regents professors? Yeah, um, really a quality group of people. So we're hoping to have feature all of them. And so uh, with that, I will turn it over to Rob to give us a little more information about the Mansfield Center and our very distinguished speaker. Thank you, Karen. Um, well, I, I am Rob Saldine with the Mansfield Center in the Political Science Department. Um, and it is really an honor to have the chance to introduce Professor Paul Lauren. Uh, Dr. Lauren is a distinguished scholar and teacher. He was the founding director of the Mansfield Center and is a Regents Professor, as Karen mentioned, a Regents Professor Emeritus of History here at the University of Montana. And during his time at UM, Paul, I think, has won uh, just about every award a professor could win, right? From the Distinguished Scholar Award to the Most Inspirational Teacher Award, the Distinguished Service to International Education Award, the Panzer Award for Fostering Humane Learning, the Montana Professor of the Year by the Carnegie Foundation, uh, the Governor's Humanities Award. Uh, that is not the full list, but I, I, I trust you get the picture. Now, for our purposes here tonight, though, I, I think two things are especially worth noting. First, when it comes to Mike and Maureen Mansfield, there is simply no one better to learn from than Paul. Um, and that's because Paul had a long and deep relationship with Mike and Maureen. Uh, Paul visited them in Tokyo. It was Paul who accompanied them around the state on their final visit home to Montana. And it was also Paul, I think, who more than anyone else was the key figure in getting Senator Mansfield's blessing to establish the center that bears his name. Now, you know, Paul had some help, uh, Jim Lopatch, Dan Smith, Jack Mudd, uh, Pat Williams, I'm probably uh, missing a few there, but, but Paul was really at the heart of that. The second thing I wanted to emphasize is Paul's connection to the Mansfield Center's ethics and public affairs mission. It was this piece of the Mansfield legacy that was the original inspiration for the center and that Senator Mansfield himself considered to be at the core of his legacy. And uh, Paul, in addition to serving as the center's founding director, he also served as the Mansfield Professor of Ethics and Public Affairs. And that was fitting because Paul really embodies that commitment to the ethical life in uh, a way that is, I think, incredibly, uh, incredibly rare. Uh, from his work as a scholar, a teacher, a mentor in founding and directing the center, but also in his personal life away from campus, Paul really is guided uh, by that same ethical compass uh, that we associate with Mike Mansfield. So I certainly uh, count Paul as uh, one of my mentors and see him as a continuing source of inspiration and guidance. So for all of those reasons, there really is no one better to hear from on the topic of the life and legacy of Mike Mansfield. Uh, please help me welcome Paul Lauren. Thanks, Bob. All right. <clears throat> Thank you for... Um... A generous introduction. I probably don't deserve that uh, kind of credit, but thank you, Ron. I want to, uh, before I step behind the podium, I just want to thank you for coming tonight. 
uh, there was another speech you could have listened to tonight. Uh, I expect the behavior of this audience to be significantly different and better, I might add. Uh, it's a delight to see so many here. I'm also really surprised that so many have signed on to listen to this lecture on Zoom. This modern technology means all kinds of things. And I usually don't speak on behalf of technology, but this is one of those rare occasions. There are over 300 people that are listening to this lecture around the country and in other parts of the world, according to the registry. In uh, the United States, there are people in New York, in Washington, Virginia, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, end of the West, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Idaho, Montana, obviously, Washington, and Oregon. Uh, I know that there's one in Hong Kong. There's one, there are a couple in Mexico. There's one, if you can believe it, in Botswana. So, so welcome uh, to this lecture in Missoula, Montana. I've been asked uh, for a number of years to give a lecture about Mike and Maureen Mansfield. And uh, now is probably the time to do it. Uh, and I do it for several reasons, and I want to explain what those are. One, I want to do whatever I can to support Molly, a wonderfully successful program here in Missoula because of the quality of people who live here, who are just intellectually curious, who want to keep learning. I also want to do it to do whatever I can to support the Mansfield Center. I also want to give the lecture because that for those of you who have lived in this state a long time, uh, memories sometimes fade, and perhaps there are portions of this lecture that will let you relive some of those memories, and especially your memory of Mike and Maureen Mansfield. There also are many of you who have moved to Missoula in the last 30 years, and one must wonder from time to time, well, who the heck was Mike Mansfield? I mean, everywhere we go, we see something about him, and uh, this is an opportunity to find out at least something about him. Another reason is that uh, it's an opportunity for me to finally set some records straight about the role that Maureen played. Uh, usually things that are written about Mike Mansfield always are about Mike, but I'll let him speak for himself about the contributions that Maureen made. And I think that it's time to give her her due. And finally, uh, I'd like to give this lecture because it's a reminder to all of us and I include myself, that politics in America doesn't have to be the way that it is. And that it, it hasn't always been this way. And that, uh, as always, the men and women that we elect to um, hold high office need to represent high qualities of character and values. And secondly, and I'm being pointed here, the people who elect them have to have some notion of character and values. And so the theme of character will be a, a significant part of my comments this evening. Right? If I were in the classroom, I would have an outline on the board. There'd be a piece of chalk in my hand or a, a marker for a whiteboard, but I wanna give you some idea of where I'm going for the outline. I'm going to begin with a discussion about perspective. Uh, then we'll move into Mansfield's early life and his time frame from the beginning through his University of Montana career. Then I'll move into politics. And I want to separate that discussion into two parts. One will be domestic politics. The other will be foreign affairs. That foreign affairs section will then transition into the ambassadorship transition into the Mansfield Center. And finally, I'll say something about his quote, retirement. I'll end with a discussion about character. That's the plan. What's that? My wife has to do these things too. So. Okay, I'm going to do this.
Is Zoom on, turned on on this, John? Yes. Well, we're fixing this. This is a reminder that um, when I began my teaching career, I only had one piece of equipment, a piece of chalk. <laughs> and nothing can go wrong with this piece of chalk. Is that? If you walk just a few yards outside of this building, you would see a statue of Mike and Marie in Mansfield. And if you went a little bit further south, you'd run into the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Library. And you went through the doors and went up one flight of stairs in addition to the archives, Donna, you would see the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Center. If you went to Helena, you'd see a statue of Maureen and Mike Mansfield. If you read Mary Moe's articles in the Missoulian, which I always find interesting and thoughtful, on occasion, you'd see some reference to In Search of Better Angels. Mike Mansfield was a statesman for all seasons and lived for his country. Right? In all of this, you might say to me or to others, well, this is interesting, Paul, but you've lost perspective. You're too close to him. You know him too well. Or that every university wants to have a spotlight on is some of its most famous alums. Or Montana is a state with a less than a million people. You're talking about somebody who's a big fish in a small place. And so what's the big deal about Mike Mansfield? Well, I think that's probably a legitimate question to ask, but as you're trying to find an answer, I would like to take you to two places. If I had the capacity to put you into a machine like uh, Star Trek and transport you someplace, right at this moment, I would take you to the Capitol. It's probably busy at the moment, but we would go to another room and I'd take you to the Senate room 207. And in 207, we'd open the door, we'd walk in, there are dark wood panels all over the walls and you'd see two portraits. One of these is that of George Washington. The other is a life-size portrait of Mike Mansfield. That didn't just happen. And if that didn't convince you, this is what the portrait looks like. And I'll explain the reasons for this in a few moments. If that wasn't sufficient, I would say I'd take this same machine to transport us all, and I'd take you to Tokyo. I'd take us to Tokyo. And here, for anyone who is an adult, who has experienced politics and is an adult from the 70s on, the name of Mike Mansfield is, quite frankly, just revered. I've seen it with my own eyes. It's happened over and over again. And uh, I, I use these examples to give you some sense of perspective that goes far, far beyond the University of Montana and Montana and America, for that matter. So who was this man? What I'd like to do is give you some sense of his history. And in the process, let him speak for himself. And that is, I'm going to use a couple, several quotations this evening in order to let Mike Mansfield speak for himself, to be here so that you can hear his words, not mine, and also to let you hear the voices of other people other than mine on their assessments of what this man and his wife meant. So to begin, Mike Mansfield is born in 1903, and he is born of Irish immigrants who, as I'm imagining, a number of people in this room, including my own, whose grandparents or great-grandparents came through Ellis Island, right? They landed in New York. They had three children. And his mother 
Catherine, Helen, Mike Mansfield is the oldest. And I just have you look at the image because you can see that he's, he's not really smiling. And I, personally, I think that this is uh, typical of his youth. Uh, and he does, has reason not to smile because his mother dies very early and his father, who was a construction worker, fell and had a serious industrial accident. And he's got three young kids. What to do with them? No mother, father who's incapable of caring for him. And he, he calls, his father calls his aunt and uncle. In other words, the great aunt and uncle of Mike and, and his, his sisters, who happened to have a grocery store in Great Falls, Montana. Now you can imagine, here, here's a couple who is in their 50s, they've got no children, and all of a sudden they've got three young kids. Right? You can imagine the disruption, and this is why I want to draw your picture, your attention to his face. He's not a happy boy. There's a rare picture of him smiling. But having said that, he's a serious troublemaker. And rather than having me tell you about it, I'll have him tell you himself. So I'm reading from his own memoirs. He has a chapter called Running Away. <laughs> After my mother's death, my two sisters and I were sent to Great Falls, Montana to live with my father's uncle and aunt. I could not get along with my aunt. I was probably, if the truth be known, a stubborn youngster. I made two attempts to run away from home during my grade school years. I ran away first in 1913. I got about 20 miles out of town before I was caught, brought back to Great Falls and spent a night in jail. The next morning I returned to my aunt. A year later, I ran away from home again. What he doesn't say is that he spent a year in a reform school, right, in Twin Bridges. I hadn't finished the eighth grade when I ran away. I rode the rods, the railway lines, like I was a hobo. I'd get into an empty freight train and go with it as far as it went and then get on to another one to see where it went. I worked in logging camps. It was very low, very crude, very simple work. But that's the way work was in those days. Mm -hmm. First World War broke out in 1914, but America is not involved till 1917. And then he continues. I decided to join the military service when I was just 14, but my father wouldn't sign anything which said that I was 18 years old. So I just forged the certificate and I got out of church that I got out of church and signed my father's name to it. Finally, I went to a Navy recruiting station and they accepted me. It was a war incidentally in which Japan and the US were allies. <laughs> my enlistment in the Navy was for the duration of the war. My grandfather would have said the same thing, for the duration. Then I served in the Army. Then in November 1920, I went to the Marine Corps recruiting station and joined up for the two year period of time. And then this is important. It was during my Marine Corps service that I first traveled to Manila, to China, to Japan. Finally, my boyhood dreams of visiting far off lands were realized as Asia suddenly was opened up to me. Right? The war is over. I mean, he goes, by the way, and you can see him in these images. These are old photographs, so the resolution is not what we've come to expect. He finds friends. You see him actually smiling. Right? He looks happy. He's on a ship. He goes to Manila. This ship launched from Manila, went to Japan, went to China. Right? and open up this lifelong interest to him. And in the end, all wars are over. 
And when that happens, there's not only reconstruction to do, but there's a question of what do you do if you happen to be in uniform and the war is over and they don't need you any longer? So he returns to Montana. He has no close family. He has no home. He has no job. He has no prospects. He has no money. Right? That's a pretty bleak future. Right? And so what does he do? What a lot of other people did at the time, he works in the mines. This is not a picture of Mike Mansfield, but it's a question of the mines in Butte. This is dirty, dangerous, hard work. And for any of you who have ever visited the mining museum in Butte and gone down, down in the ground, you'll have some idea about this. This experience lasted for nine years. He's a mucker, right? Shoveling down inside the mines. And uh, two things resulted from this. One, a deep appreciation for uh, hard physical work, the costs of workers who are injured and have no insurance and no way to cover their medical bills, and an expression that he kept the rest of his life, which is tapper light. It has to do with dynamite, right? Tapper light. And so there were any number of times when he's talking about somebody, the need to be careful. Uh, in conversations about politics or other, he's always a tapper light, right? This came out of the minds of Butte. In this process, there was a turning point. And the turning point was a young woman. So I'll let my Mansfield speak to him, speak to you himself. After my tour in the Marine Corps ended in 1922, I went to Butte, a copper mining town. I worked there for nine years. It was in Butte that I met my wife, Maureen Hayes. Since we first met in 1928, my wife has been the greatest influence on my life, bar none. I'll return to that theme on two other occasions. Maureen Hayes graduated from St. Mary's College in Indiana before returning to Butte to work as a school teacher. From that time we met, Maureen urged me to make myself better, to look for work other than the copper mines in order to live a longer life. Miners were dying pretty young from the miner's con or consumptive condition caused by exposure to copper dust and from mining accidents. Maureen told me, you've got to get an education. And I replied, I haven't even finished the eighth grade yet. How can I get an education? But Maureen didn't give up easy enough. Right? Well, Maureen Hayes responded, you can make up your high school credits some way and you have to get a better education. Get out of Butte and go to the University of Montana. Right? So he did. Maureen kept on after me. I took some correspondence courses and summer course at the U of M to earn additional credits. After completing my high school equivalency course in December 1931, I quit the mines and became a regular university student in Missoula. In the fall, and this is a picture of them in Butte, right? you can tell he's smiling again, right? not always a, an image of him. Right? He goes to Missoula and in uh, He's in Missoula. She's still teaching the school in Butte. And in 1932, there's an article that appears in the Missoulian. It's a little faded and blurry, but those were the times. Marriage license. Michael Mansfield and Maureen Hayes, both of Missoula. They both are here in Missoula. Interestingly enough, we still have the graduation document. And if you look, you'll see candidates for degrees. Maureen Hayes Mansfield, Missoula, right? Uh, they're on English. The first item under here in history, 
Michael Joseph Mansfield, Missoula. He graduates in 1932 at the age of 30 years old. Right? You want to talk about a non-traditional student, right? this is him. So he recounts about the fact that he is a, he's worked hard to do this. He's trying to find work. It's very, very difficult to do. And uh, he earns a master's degree in one year. The standards were different. He becomes a professor. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But in the meantime, Maureen is working. And there was a time that you could argue that Maureen was much better known than Mike. This is a notice that you wouldn't indicate this by the title, but if you can, you can read the, the language here. Mrs. Maureen Mansfield, in charge of child welfare work for the State Department of Public Welfare in five Western Montana counties, including Missoula County, spoke on the work in which her department does. She mentioned that she works with physically, mentally, and socially handicapped children whom she helps to adjust to current conditions. Financial assistance must be found for some children living with their own homes. Mothers are taught and helped to care for their own children properly. Unmarried mothers and their children are aided. Assistance is given probation officers and courts. Cooperation with youth organizations is given. Here's a woman who is very active in the community and a woman who has a great compassion for those in need. This is going to have a long lasting influence on her and on Mike. Mm -hmm. And it's something that most people just don't know about. 1939, uh, their only daughter, Anne, is born, born here in Missoula. And um, I'll say more, a little bit more, more about it, Anne, shortly. But the center of their life, really, with reference to Mike Mansfield, is the University of Montana. He becomes a professor. He teaches Asian history, Latin American history, and he is desperately interested in foreign affairs and in the affairs of politics. Right? And so, as everyone knows, once you become a professor, wealth automatically follows. And he, uh, lo and behold, somewhere along the line, he uh, is capable of owning an automobile. But it's worthwhile to indicate his, as he describes this setting. Almost everyone was out of a job in the early 1930s. My wife had to cash in her life insurance policy to keep us going. I remember at the time buying three pounds of hamburger for just 25 cents during the depression. I bought the hamburger back home and thought that I had accomplished a great deal. But my wife, Maureen, began to cry. Why? Because we did not own a refrigerator and the hamburger would begin to spoil within a day or so. So my wife gave the hamburger to some neighbors. Prices were very low, but people just didn't have money to buy. I tell you, it was a terrible, terrible era. And he goes on then to explain this. In Missoula, where we live, my wife could see freight trains coming through Missoula crossing Montana with lots of people on them, looking elsewhere for jobs, and this made a deep impression on her and on me. My wife thought that things had to be done to help the poor. She saw that the state government couldn't do the job, so she looked to the federal government instead. This is important for what is about to happen, right? We decided, and uh, I'll say that we decided. One of the things, my guess is that since history professors and political science professors teach about the subject, there probably isn't one who's ever lived who at some time or another hasn't thought about going into politics. 
and saying, you know, this is interesting. I like books, but that would be interesting to actually play a role. Or you might say, I could do a better job than they could, uh, but it, it crosses your mind, right? In all events, he set his sight away from the academic life toward Washington, D.C. And this is the way that he describes it. And Mike Mansfield is better at describing this setting rather than any historian because he lived through it. This, this conveys his own thinking. We decided, Maureen and I, that I would run for a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives in 1940. The field was open, but the three Democrats who ran in the Democratic primary, I finished third in last place. A woman named Jeanette Rankin <laughs> won the Republican primary, and also Jeanette Rankin won the general election in November 1940. <laughs> Hence Rankin Hall and all the other signs of Jeanette Rankin on this campus. In all events, Mike is elected in 1942, and he becomes a member of Congress. Right. He spends from 1942 to 1952 in the House of Representatives. And then he spends from 1952 to 1977 in the Senate. He becomes Senate Majority Leader in 1961 and stays in that position until 1977 and until just a few months ago, served as the longest serving Senate majority leader in American history. When, uh, and in doing this, he succeeded Lyndon Johnson. Uh, I wanna just mention that when we approached Congress on behalf of the Mansfield Center, I had the privilege of visiting with Howard Baker, who happened to be Senate Majority Leader, Republican at the time, who also happened to be the son, I mean, the son-in-law of Everett Dirksen. And I said to him, look, I'm just kind of curious. Said, Rob, this is something you would talk to, given our interest, you'd say to a sitting senator, what was your experience? So I said, well, tell me, what was it like to go from Lyndon Johnson, the Senate Majority Leader, to Mike Mansfield? And he smiled and he said, I'll tell you exactly. It was like going from Genghis Khan to St. Francis of Assisi. <laughs> so in this experience, Mike sets to work and he's not alone. And he's there with his wife, Maureen. And this isn't a kind of a tourist shot, right? You can tell just by her body posture that she's, uh, she's there to do something, right? She's ready to work. So as I begin this political dimension, I want to establish a perspective of time. Time. So look at the presidents that he served under. Franklin Roosevelt. Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, John Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan. I mean, that's a span of time with highly different personalities, highly different political agendas. If that's the perspective of time, then what about this perspective of setting? It's easy to become, a, in my mind, it's easy to become a leader in good times. But what about challenging times? I want to give you some sense about this. When he's in Congress, 1942, the United States is still involved, the world is involved in the Second World War both in North Africa, in Europe, in the Pacific, and throughout Asia. The atomic bomb is dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? 
by August uh, 1945. People are thrilled that the war is over. They were excited about victory. But as a historian, I'll tell you that victory doesn't mean suddenly that there's peace and all the pieces are put back together again. Berlin was a ruined, Dresden was ruined, Nagasaki, Hiroshima were ruined in the same way that uh, Gaza and uh, Ukraine are going to leave years and years of rubble, no matter what the outcome is. Some actors don't change, some actors say the same. Stalin is still the leader of the Soviet Union. The quote, peace in Europe turns into a cold war. Europe is divided. The Iron Curtain slashes between West and East. And I can just tell you from personal experience, it was no fun to cross that border. Um, in 1949, um, communist revolution takes place. Mao Zedong comes into power, right? Launching communist China. 1950, the Korea War begins. At the end of the war, can you hear me? This is why someone needs to help. Europe. Thank you. All right? Thanks. You need help on that there. European empires still existed. One of the major campaigns of the Second World War was that it would be a war for human rights and people under colonial empires would ultimately be free. But all you have to do is look at this map and look at this swath, look at Africa, for example, French West Africa, the British swath that goes from Egypt all the way down to South Africa, moves over into what is now Pakistan, India, right? a place called French Indochina, right? Longing to be free from colonial empires and wondering whether it's going to happen. This is also a time when McCarthyism emerges in the United States. And most people don't know this, but Joe McCarthy came to Missoula, Montana in order to help defeat Mike Mansfield in the 1952 election. It was so nasty, Mansfield almost said, I don't ever want to be in politics again. Right? 1950s also saw the explosion of the hydrogen bomb and continued arms race. 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And for those of us who lived in 1962 and remember this, you know how frightening that was. For those of us involved in the civil rights movement, it was a time of um, brutality, hope and brutality at the same time. Massive protests in the streets. March in Washington, 1963. And it doesn't stop there. Kennedy's assassinated. The war in Vietnam escalates. Because of that war, there are massive protests in the streets, protests on university campuses, including the University of Montana, this is Kent State, the drafting of very young men, and the fact that they could be drafted and fight, but they couldn't vote unless they were 21. It was also a time in which uh, people who needed medical care and attention who were destitute could not have it and languished in a bed someplace. It was also a time when Martin Luther King was assassinated and also a time when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. At the time that he was shot, it wasn't known that he would die. 
but this was what Mansfield had to say at the time. I grieve for my country and for the Kennedys. What is wrong with our country that there can be an assassination of President Kennedy, a Medgar Evers, a Martin Luther King, and possibly a Senator Robert Kennedy? When in the name of God has happened to us, are we so blind that we cannot see? Are we so deaf that we cannot hear? Are we so dumb that we cannot understand? Are we so filled with hatred that we cannot love and appreciate one another? Are we so immersed in ourselves that we cannot live with one another in peace and amity? Are we so violent that we fail to comprehend the basic tenets of a democracy? These were his words in 1968. You can imagine what he might say about the mass gun attacks in our own time. But 1968 was not finished. There's the shameful 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago, riots in the streets, it will bring back memories for some of you. The Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, right? The Yom Kippur War, one of many in the Middle East, right? Pollution of our air, massive clear cutting and no respect for uh, wilderness areas. Watergate mm -hmm. and the resignation of a president and huge scandals involving the Central Intelligence Agency for political assassinations, for drug testing and among unsuspecting American citizens, for wiretappings, for persecution of those who, pro who protested the war in Vietnam. What is my point of all of this? This is the setting. Look, we're all both beneficiaries and victims of the time in which we live. These were the times when Mike Mansfield was Senate Majority Leader and involved in Congress. And so when you judge, when any of us judge what he did or what he didn't do, it has to be seen in this setting, in my mind. So what did he do? <laughs> Every day, Mansfield, despite all of his other responsibilities, spent the first part of his day working on Montana constituent affairs. And for anyone who has lived here for more than 50 years, you surely have a personal letter from Mike Mansfield on some issue that you wrote him about and he wrote a personal letter back to you. That is, he had, uh, he understood perfectly well. And he said over and over again, my first responsibility is to the people of Montana. And uh, he took that seriously. And the other thing that was so interesting about it in my mind is that he had an absolutely legendary memory. He remembered names, names of you, names of your family members, names of your relatives, names of your friends. I mean, it just, it, it, when you watched it in action, you just could hardly believe that this was happening. I remember a time driving Mike and Maureen Mansfield um, from Missoula to Butte, and they wanted to turn off at Drummond, go through Phillipsburg up by Georgetown Lake and come down into Anaconda. So this is for those of you with Anaconda connections. We drove into Anaconda and Mike and Maureen were talking, oh dear, remember this, oh dear, yes. And Mike would say, oh, Mrs. So-and-so lived in that house. Mr. So-and-so and his uncle lived over here. And he knew the names of these. This was decades after the fact, right? And you just kind of saw it, sat back in wonder and wonder, how does he do this? And after we went through the town of Anaconda, he must have named 20 different people that, that used to live there. Maureen turned to him and she said, oh dear, remember how happy we were when the election returns came in from Anaconda. He never forgot where he was from. This is actually a photo of his license plate in Washington, right? A member of Congress and his four uh, prefects on the Missoula plate. 
uh, he and Maureen were partners, clearly. And this, this image shows them clearly in a public setting, but this image shows them in a working setting. And it was not unusual. That is, he heavily uh, depended upon her advice, as he said, over and over again. He also had the great benefit of working with a member of the other party. I know this is going to be hard to comprehend. The Senate Minority Leader by the name of Everett Dirksen, right? Both of whom were willing to work together for the good of the country who put partisan politics aside. And it helps to explain why much of this legislation took place. So uh, with reference to the setting and domestic politics, when Kennedy is assassinated, who did the family select to give the eulogy in the Capitol? Mike Mansfield. Mansfield was heavily responsible for the limited nuclear test ban treaty in 1963. What's unusual about this picture, and I'll talk about this in just a moment, is that Mansfield is actually in it. He's off to the side, from your picture, as you can see, but when this photograph was reproduced for the New York Times, they cut Mansfield out. And this is also an unusual picture, Wilderness Act of 1964 in which he is clearly smiling with Lyndon Johnson. And this is one of the last times you're going to see Mike Mansfield in a photo op. Here's the monumental Civil Rights Act of 1964. Right? The Senate Majority Leader at the time and this is what he says to his colleagues in the Senate. Now it is the time and the turn of our institution, the US Senate. Racial inequalities are among the oldest and most dangerous faults of the structure of this nation. What we do here in the 88th Congress will not in itself correct all these faults, but we can and we must join the wisdom the collective wisdom of this body. So the efforts of others in this nation to finally face up to them for what they are, a serious erosion of the fundamental rock upon which the unity of this nation stands. There's an ebb and flow in human affairs, which at rare moments bring a complex of human events into delicate balance. At those moments, the acts of government may indeed influence, for better or for worse, the course of history itself. This is such a moment in the life of this nation. This is the moment for the Senate. If ever the members of this body have needed to strive to put aside personal advantage and partisan political considerations and to seek their national good in its noblest of terms, now is the time. I now move that the Senate proceed to consider the Civil Rights Bill. Right? After much debate, considerable debate, the act is passed. It, has been, it is clearly a model, a, a triumph of bipartisanship. It's probably the greatest piece of legislation in the 20th century in the United States. It hasn't solved all problems, it's still under threat, but it was monumental. And interestingly enough, and this is why I want you to look at this photograph, Mike Mansfield is not in this because he wants to let others take the credit. When it's done, members of the Democratic Party urged him, they said, look, stand up, this is our success, a monumental achievement of the Senate. And he said to them, it wouldn't have happened without Everett Dirksen. He's the one that got the Republicans to vote for it, right? We had to confront with our own party. We had to confront with the Dixiecrats. Let him go ahead and take the credit. I mean, can you imagine that happening? 
And that's why in the other legislation, you will not see Mike Mansfield standing behind. Other people wanted to be in the picture, right? They're running for office, so they want to say I was next to the president, not Mike Mansfield. Voting Rights Act occurs next year in 1965. The same year, Medicare Act is enacted by this Congress, right? And for everyone who is over 65, they're going to have a new meaning for, uh, for Medicare. So in this process, people are clearly talking about Mike Mansfield, about his level of achievement, and about his character. Even at an early stage, and I want to read this passage become, because it comes early, not late in the career. Jack Anderson, a columnist, as many of you will remember, wrote the following of him early. Mike Mansfield, is, and I quote him, a rock of integrity, conscientious about his duties, courageous in his convictions, incorruptible. Mike is poor by Senate standards. Not until two years ago, he was able to scrape up enough money to pay, put a down payment on their own home. His sense of values lies in principle, not in the pocketbook. This rugged integrity has made Mike a powerhouse in the Senate. He's a senator's senator, liked and respected by his colleagues. They know his word is like the Bible. They trust his motives. They listen to his advice. Now, those are unusual words by a columnist that normally has nothing but criticism for political leaders and at an early stage. In this effort, he also made attempts to develop some sense of collegiality. And one of my favorite photos, uh, here he's talking to John, I mean, John Kennedy is playing with Scoop Jackson from the state of Washington. And not surprisingly, who's the umpire? <laughs> Mike Mansfield. And uh, he calls him like he sees him. And they're going to listen to him. Right? They're not going to turn around and say, are you out of your mind? I mean, listen, that was way outside. And at the same time, and here I want to come back to Maureen. Maureen is heavily involved in all of these activities. And so in 1965, not at the end of her life, not during a funeral service, that's why I think this is so important, Mike is invited to give a lecture in 1965. And he says this, so I'm gonna let him speak to you. All too often, the women who stand with public figures go unnoticed and unsung. But I know and I'm delighted to acknowledge that if I had not had Maureen Mansfield by my side through the years thus far, these years of public life would not have been possible. If I had not drawn strength from her patience, if I had not found courage in her understanding, if I had not had access to her wisdom, I would not be with you today. You would not have the occasion to even invite me, right? For the simple reason that I would not have anything very much to say to you. I mean, what a remarkable testimony to his life partner. But then the action still continued, right? Clean Air Act, 1970. 26th Amendment that he pushed strongly in order to get endorsement, and that is you can be 18 years old and vote, right? You don't have to be 21. Uh, None of these, I might add, was without controversy, as you can imagine, right? And then there's the Watergate hearings. And I want to have you look at this photo for a minute. Here's a committee that is charged with investigating the alleged wrongdoings of a president of the United States. There are Democrats and there are Republicans. 
Mansfield has carefully chosen the, the Democrats and he had two criteria. He didn't want anyone on the committee that was going to run for president because they would use it to grandstand. Secondly, he did not want anyone that was known as highly partisan. And so for all of you who listened to these Watergate hearings, what you saw is conscientious senators listening to evidence, calling witnesses, and having the honesty to say the President of the United States has violated the law. Right. Shortly after that, as a result of the wrongdoings of the uh, intelligence community, Mike Mansfield pushed for the creation of the Church Committee. Now, anyone in the field of international relations knows perfectly well you need an effective and strong intelligence community. The challenge is when you have one in a democratic society, right? But given the abuses that were described as a rogue elephant out of control, right? Mansfield created the church committee. And if you look at the images here, right? Look at both the Democrats and the Republicans. And among the Republicans, you're looking at Barry Goldwater, right? Who once again, honestly looked at the evidence and questioned about whether it was in the rule of law or not. And when Mansfield created this, this is the speech that he gave. The Senate, I'm telling you, must be satisfied that the intelligence community is doing the people's business to the end that the nation, with assurance, may be so advised. The Senate must be persuaded that what is being done in the name of security under the cloak of obscurity is the people's business, as defined not by the employees of a government agent, but the people's business as defined by the Constitution and the laws duly enacted thereunder. It used to be fashionable, Mr. President, for members of Congress to say insofar as the intelligence agencies are concerned, the less they knew about such questions, the better. Well, in my opinion, it's about time that that attitude went out of fashion. It is time for the Senate to take the trouble and yes, the risks of knowing more rather than less. And so with a great deal of attention to questions of intelligence, the final report was issued meaning that their select committee is now in the House and in the Senate uh, to monitor on classified information, the activities of the various agencies of the broader intelligence community. This is called the Foreign and Military Intelligence Report. And this brings me to the Foreign Affairs section, right? if you're still with me. Mansfield taught foreign affairs when he was here at the University of Montana. It always was his passion, right? And so amazingly, as a young, that is in terms of seniority, member of Congress in 1944, Roosevelt, who is not happy with the reports that his military commanders are giving him about Asia, sends Mansfield to go to Asia on a private mission as a personal emissary. He goes to India, he goes to Burma, and he goes to China. And so in this, you see him talking to individual soldiers. He always made a point of asking anyone here from Montana and wanted to spend time with them and he, he'd come back home, report to their families about what was happening. But he seriously discussed these with him. The report came back, his assessment to Roosevelt um, directed American, to some extent, American policy toward Asia at the end of the war, because this occurred in 1944. By 1951, right, the UN is in operation. President Truman names Mike Mansfield to be on the US delegation of the UN as a delegate 
Here he happens to be in Paris at the time, signing a document on behalf of the United States. And all of these years, Mansfield served on both the House Committee on Foreign Affairs and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, right? Because this was his passion. And so in this capacity, he traveled all over the place. And in doing so, took very careful notes. Uh, and when he came back, uh, would write up very lengthy reports of analysis, uh, many of them that were published uh, in, in leading journals. This is a particular image of him on his way to Latin America. He visited Latin America, he visited Europe, he visited Asia on several occasions. And in this process, he looked at the world and was very much influenced by this whole movement of decolonization. Years later, I happened to be in Algeria giving a series of lectures for the State Department. It was a dangerous assignment. I was accompanied by an armed bodyguard from the Diplomatic Security Service. But the only reason to bring it up in this setting is that prior to one of my lectures, a government official from Algeria came up to me. We started talking and he just said almost casually, well, Professor Lorne, where's your home university? And I said, proudly, University of Montana. And he said, Montana? May I spot? I said, yes. He said, let me shake your hand. And I'm wondering, okay. He said, that's the home of Mike Mansfield. This is in North Africa, right? And he said, Mike Mansfield was the first member of the US Congress that publicly stated he thought that Algeria ought to be free from French colonialism. I had no idea, right? I said, well, it just shows you something about his, his influence. Then there was the war in Vietnam. Mansfield visited Vietnam on several occasions. He argued that it was the, uh, the greatest failure of his career to not be able to bring a quicker end to the war in Vietnam. And um, he spoke again and again to uh, Johnson privately, not publicly, but in those private conversations, he would tell Johnson exactly what he thought. Uh, so I'm going to read a quote from Johnson, and I want to emphasize the language is not mine. <laughs> is it? It's Lyndon Johnson's. But um, George McGovern went to talk to Johnson about ending the war as well. And Johnson said, damn it, George, don't give me another history lesson. I've got a whole drawer full of history lessons over there from Mike Mansfield, another professor. I don't have time to be sitting around reading this desk about all these damn history books. Well, as a history professor, I take that as a badge of honor. Uh, but it tells you something about his approach to these things. Foreign affairs meant that he visited any number of foreign leaders, and I could have a long series of photographs here, but the point is that he visited with many. Here's one with Chow and Lai. Uh, during the opening of China, 1972. Uh, Tiff Roberts is here in the audience who is really the expert on China from the Mansfield Center. There's a later picture here of Mike and Maureen at Chow and La. You'll see the expressions on their face are different. In this expression, they both know that Chow and Lai has cancer and he's about to die. And so that friendly nature is, is the seriousness. Mansfield visits China. Uh, at the opening, he's one of the first of the delegations of the president. And then he retires. This is a photograph of Mike Mansfield on his last day in the US Senate. And he's walking down the stairs. His body posture tells you, yeah, you know, it's almost over. What should I make of this? 
and he is not smiling. And so, so many pictures of Mansfield indicate that he is not smiling. And I want to give you just a little bit better, different side. Right? He smiled on occasion <laughs> when things were good. Smiled when he was in, with important people. Smiled when he was with unimportant people. And had a good sense of humor. At the time that he retired, the Senate just could hardly stand the loss. It was a dramatic loss. On his last day, 50 senators of both parties, liberal and Democrats, stood up giving a tribute to him. Some of them talked about his accomplishments, but most talked about his character. A man of honesty, a man of integrity, a man who you could trust. And so this is the background of calling this room now the Mansfield Room. With this full length portrait of him, a close up of the face will give you some sense. So while this is happening and the tributes are taking place, there are those of us at the University of Montana that thought, you know, we shouldn't let an opportunity like this just pass. Uh, here's a, an example of model public service, a man of integrity. There ought to be something that we should do. And so there was a small group. Rob has mentioned briefly this. Jim Lopatch, which kind of chaired the committee. Jack Mudd, Dan Smith, myself. A little bit later, Albert Borgman and a very good friend, Dan Lambros, who was a great support to me all worked in terms of trying to develop a concept of the Mansfield Center. So the question was, all right, we have these ideas, what can we do about this? Well, after several years of discussion, because we started in the 1970s, in 1981, uh, President Dick Bowers called me into his office. He said, listen, Paul, somebody needs to go to Japan and talk to him. If he's gonna have his name on it, you need to know what he really thinks, and I want you to go. And I said, all right, uh, I'll do my best. So I got on a plane, coach class, flew to Seattle, got ready in Seattle to fly to Tokyo. Uh, I'm in the line at Tokyo, and uh, the clerk behind, the man behind the counter says, uh, you know, typical question, business or pleasure? I said, business. He said, oh, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a university professor. Oh, well, you're probably not going to go to talk to businessmen then. I said, well, probably not. And he said, government leaders? Well, you know, I was pursuing this a little in more detail than I felt comfortable with. I said, yeah, government leaders. He said, you going to the U.S. Embassy by any chance? I said, yeah, I'm going to the U.S. Embassy. Are you going to see Mike Mansfield? I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, I am. He took my ticket and ripped it in two. And I'm wondering, what the heck? He did some typing and he said, here, here's a first class ticket. Courtesy of Thai Airlines in our respect for Ambassador Mansfield. Well, obviously nothing I had done. <laughs> uh, it just, it was an indication of how somebody in a completely different business had, knew about Mike Mansfield and wanted to do something about it. So I went to talk to him, uh, experienced the whole thing about him welcoming me, talking about Montana, pouring a cup of coffee on his own, bringing it out of his office. And I said, we've got a plan. And our plan is the Mansfield Center. So he listened carefully, he thought about it, I'd communicated with advance and he said, that's fine. But he said, I have four conditions. One, whatever has my name on it has Maureen's name on it. Okay. Two, whatever is done in my name must be done at the University of Montana, nowhere else. Three, whatever is done must have permanence and quality. I don't want any fly-by-night operation. And fourthly, there will be no fundraising in Japan as long as I'm ambassador. Okay, understood that. 
Well, those are powerful conditions. And uh, I, my task was to come back home and explain this to a lot of people who are waiting for the information. Governor, President of the University, Faculty Senate, Board of Regents, Montana Congressional Delegation, and so on. At that moment, I had great empathy for how Moses must have felt coming down from Mount Sinai. And I told them, some were happy with this, some were not happy about it, but it happened. And so it meant that the, the Mansfield Center was created at the University of Montana. We did conferences on ethics and public affairs, conferences on leadership, character, and civic virtue. Some of you have already seen, because it was out here in front of the door, about the impact statement of all of the internships, fellowships, programs, dialogues, policy discussions that the Vancefield Center does here at the University of Montana. Thousands of students, faculty and others have been involved. And at the same time, the Man Maureen and Mike Mansfield Foundation was created in 1983 by an act of Congress. I served a couple of terms on that. Its initial task was for fundraising, but it subsequently has done all kinds of things in the area of policy, most notably the creation of Mansfield Fellows, government officials who spend a year in Japan learning the language, learning what they can with their counterparts in Japan, and then coming back home as knowledgeable experts on Japan. There have been partners with us. It's been a very successful program. As ambassador, Mansfield made a tremendous impact dealing with prime ministers, he was frequently in the news, right? dealing with freight, trade issues, dealing with cultural relations between Montana and Japan, dealing with other diplomats in Asia. He's sit seated in the center. Right? Jimmy Carter told me that there was only one thing that he and Ronald Reagan ever agreed upon. He told me that in person in Missoula. Ronald Reagan did a videotape, sent it to me, and he said, there's only one thing I've ever agreed with Jimmy Carter about, and that is Mike Mansfield. Mansfield was appointed by Carter and amazingly reappointed by Reagan to be U.S. ambassador. And in this process, in dealing with a number of issues, one of the most famous and most telling is the fact that in 1981, a U.S. nuclear submarine hit by accident a Japanese freighter. It damaged the freighter, several lives were lost, and the submarine kept going. It did not stop to render assistance. Right? Well, you can just imagine diplomatically what that meant. Mansfield demanded a full report. The report was finally given. And when he got the report, he made an appointment to see the Japanese foreign minister. He took the report, and I'm going to have to just use a motion here. He took the report and bowed deeply and stayed there in an apology to the Japanese. That scene was broadcast over and over again in Japan because Mansfield knew exactly what it would mean for the Japanese in terms of real apologies. Criticism in the United States existed because it's no, the US doesn't apologize. It makes us look weak. Mansfield felt strong enough in his character to, to do it. He thinks he's going to retire. And he does until someone says, well, why don't you come back to the University of Montana? And so in 1991, he returns. Interestingly enough, the sign says, welcome home, Maureen and Mike. He comes to give a lecture. Some of you were probably there. So this picture will bring back some memories. This is in the field house. It's a half an hour before the lecture is even going to take place. And by the end, there's somewhere between four and 5,000 people in the field house. Because I was the one responsible, I thought, you know, I maybe made a big mistake by inviting them to come because he's an elderly man. He did his late 80s. He just made a trip. What I want to tell you is I need not have worried. <laughs> he stood up to the podium 
and uh, just built it out a lecture like a pro. Right? And when it was over, stayed a long time later visiting with people. And look at the body language. I mean, you might recognize some of these people. I do. They feel comfortable with him. Right? They, there's not this standoffish. There's not some kind of phony smile. They feel good. And he feels good. And so when they're here, they clearly visit the uh, library in their honor. They visit the Mansfield Center. And in maybe one of my favorite pictures, she's having a good time, right? And we're joking around. He goes back to Washington because he said, look, we originally thought we were gonna live in Missoula, but it's too cold for my wife. And uh, he gives a lecture in the, con in the Senate on leadership. And he's the first in a series on leadership. He's 95 years old when he gives this lecture. And he's invited by Trent Lott, a Republican from Mississippi, to give the lecture. Mansfield once again gives just extraordinary tribute to Moraine when he begins. He said, I have nothing to say that isn't a result of her impact on my life. And the other thing that he says is he said, look, my philosophy of leadership is that you, and he quoted a Chinese sage, a leader wants to be able to have people say, I did it myself. He didn't feel like he needed to take credit. Maureen dies in 2000. He passes away in 2001. And there's a memorial service at Fort Myer um, in Arlington. And shortly after the 9-11 attack, as going to this service, you could see the charred wall of the Pentagon as you drove through. It was a remarkable service, invitation only, but there were as many Republican senators as there were Democratic senators at that. Former presidential nominees, Robert Dole, uh, George McGovern were there. So much of the Senate was there. And the one that surprised me the most was Jesse Helms from North Carolina, one of the last people I would have expected to walk through the door. He's shuffling along, he's got a nurse holding his arm, he's using a cane. But his respect for Mansfield was so enormous that um, he wanted to be there. Someone of entirely different political persuasion. Right? It gives you some idea of the testimony. Yeah. The service takes place. The representatives of the pallbearers come from the services that he was in, was in the Navy, the Army, and the Marines. The head of the Marines is the one officiating this. He's giving the flag from the coffin to, Marie, to Anne, Mike and Maureen's daughter, and to his granddaughter, Caroline. And we all go to Arlington Cemetery, and there's the tombstone. Of all of the things that he could have said, this tombstone could have been huge, right? Michael Joseph Mansfield, private, U.S. Marine Corps. This brings me to a question of character, right? and I want to conclude on this point. The achievements that I've talked about would make Mike Manfield's life impressive. It was his character that made him great. Years ago, I spoke after dinner at the embassy in Japan with Maureen. I said, tell me, what do you think his greatest contribution to public life is? Without hesitation, she said, his character, a man who believed in ethics and public affairs, right? And that's what the center was designed to do. It's his character that says something about that you can see in this tombstone. So I'd like to briefly conclude on this. One, he was humble. He stayed low key. He was humble even though he was extraordinarily accomplished. 
He poured coffee for people. He listened to those that disagreed with him. He worked to be last rather than first. And if that sounds biblical, then so be it. Right? He also was loyal. Loyal to, to Marine. Loyal to his country. Loyal to Montana. Loyal to the University of Montana over and over and over again. He was compassionate. He was compassionate to the point that he cared about workers without insurance. Compassionate for those who suffered from discrimination. Compassionate for those students who needed federal aid to go to education. Compassionate for those who wanted a clean environment. Moreover, he had a strong sense of responsibility. Responsibility to honor the rule of law, to respect his country. Right? To praise it when it did when it deserved it, to criticize it when it deserved it. Right? A sense of responsibility to do his duty, to exercise public service. Moreover, he was an honest man, a man of principle, who kept his word over and over again. There's a reason why his colleagues, I mean, his colleagues called him the conscience of the Senate. David Broder, famous columnist, the Washington Post said of him, and I quote him, he is the greatest American I ever met in my life. Right? These tributes kept coming in to him. And I'd like to end on, on this note, and that is, it was said by James Buckley. And if you know James Buckley, right? Some of you are nodding your heads. You say, oh, geez, why would you quote James Buckley on occasion like this, right? Listen to his words, and I conclude with this. Mike Mansfield is a man of few words, and so my remarks about him will be brief, especially inasmuch as he has from time to time found it necessary to chastise the Senate for producing too much talk and too little work. It is the formality of members of the Senate to refer to one another as, quote, the distinguished member, the honorable senator, end of quote, even when we we're in no mood to say so. But when that phrase is applied to our colleague from Montana, it is much more than a routine salutation. In a period of national suspicion about politics and politicians, Senator Mansfield has stood above suspicion an example to skeptics that public service in government can indeed be a noble calling. In a time of cynicism about all of our national institutions of power, Senator Mansfield's long career in Congress restores our faith in the excellence both of our political system and of its leaders when they're at their best. Like many members of the Senate, I am not at the majority leader's party, <laughs> nor do I share his political philosophy. But I trust that every member of this body shares the principles to which he has devoted his work among us. Honor, decency, fairness, tolerance. These have been his hallmarks. And those qualities, much more than our words in praise of him, will remain his most eloquent tribute. This is the account of Mike Mansfield, the man and the legacy. Thank you very much.